I've, I'm trying to get practice in my really long, extensive titles, so <laughs> this one was my best yet. Um, so uh, I'm going to breeze through just some of the work we've been doing. And a lot of the conversation when I was at PEI a couple years ago was about agroforestry adoption. And um, we've had some initial success taking research into farms and then seeing adoption start to happen in the Northeast uh, for log-grown shiitake. And so my thinking with this is what are the, some of the criteria or patterns that have worked for us that could be useful for other crops and that we're actually looking to apply to some other crops in the Northeast. And um, maybe the conversation at the end can be a little bit about other crops that might fit into this as far as criteria. Um, I have a few ideas, but certainly um, a lot of sort of proposals here about criteria. And I'd be curious if there's other things that folks are, are thinking about. So um, we initially um, and retroactively <laughs> brainstormed some of these criteria. Some of them we uh, had planned, and some of them just emerged as we went. So of course, the theme of this uh, week and, and conversations are always economic viability as a criteria for crop adoption. Um, the things I think about, especially relationship for mushrooms, are can we get consistent production throughout the growing season? So most mushrooms fruit fall or spring. Shiitake fruits year-round, or really the whole growing season, June to October in the Northeast. Um, high market demand is really important. We'll talk about that a little bit. And uh, re good return on investment, essentially. What am I investing up front for what's coming back? Coupled with that is then research on cultivation so that we can say, here's what you can grow these on, here's how. Um, reduce that grower risk. Um, and then look at issues of efficiency beyond that, not just how you grow, but where areas you can actually make some improvements. So we've done some work on both those things. Um, then there's this next level that is actually the emerging criteria, which is, are we ready to support a growing industry? Because once growers get into issues, they turn to extension first thing for, how do I deal with this issue? And uh, this was not something I'm still funded on, mostly research and a little bit of extension. Um, but it's really hard to keep up with the demand right now of what kind of problems growers are encountering that we weren't even expecting. And then zooming out is really big picture, long term. Um, is this you know, crop going to last for a long time? And that would include, for me, things like solving larger land use issues, um, providing incentives to manage ecosystems uh, and ecosystem services. Health benefits are something that I'm seeing as a, as a trend if we can get into the, the health and sort of supplement market. There's wider appeal than just the food market. And then that further product development, which is what's the potential for you know, value-added production. So why shiitake is really working well is because it's hitting a lot of these criteria. So I mentioned economically, we can get reliable production throughout the growing season and pretty good prices. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the return on investment, which is also pretty excellent. Cultivation research, University of Missouri really started that off. Um, Johan Brun and, and others there. And then Cornell has done about a, a decade's worth of research, mostly uh, Dr. Ken Mudge, which is, has paved the way to, to understand and reduce limits. One example is when shiitake first came, shiitake means uh, mushroom of the oak, essentially. The shi tree in Japan is an oak tree. And it, one of the assumptions when it came to North America was, well, then you can only grow it on oak. But it turns out you can grow it on sugar maple, American beech, hornbeam, ironwood, birch, chestnut, and a whole you know, host of other things. So it really has expanded the potential um, and some of that research, we found at Cornell that basically the yields are not insignificant, uh, uh, in significantly different between oak, sugar maple, and, and beech. Um, then the, the, the next one is the sort of support for industry development. Uh, that comes in the form of really support right now from the Cornell Small Farms and, of course, other agroforestry organizations. But when we get down to some of these specific topics in the Northeast, that's, we've sort of fallen, we've been the fallback. Um, University of Vermont had an extension position that's now working on another project, so it's been uh, quite an interesting time at the office to get these calls. Um, big picture, we're working with our forestry folks and, and talking about getting more conversations going with the emerging low value timber market. Um, there's a lot more interest in that generally with the forestry community. Incentive for what is called timber stand improvement. Um, it can be thinning woods and doing those intermediate thinnings for an eventual timber harvest. And that's something landowners and farmers often don't do because there's not that immediate economic return. With shiitake bolts, that can, that can change. And I mentioned the health benefits is really something we're starting to zoom in on. 
So um, just some examples for consistent production. We'll zoom in a little bit on that, those big points. Uh, we found that basically a log will produce, on average, a quarter to a half pound of mushrooms every time you flush it, which means you soak it in water for 24 hours. And a grower can uh, push production. You have to rest the log after soaking, get two or three flushes of mushrooms per season. And those logs will last for an average of eight flushes or uh, three to four years. And so that's a really nice investment. You inoculate a log, and you can use it for several growing seasons. Um, Market demand, really interesting factor here. Um, you can see the, the grocery store mushrooms on the, the right that are mostly grown indoors on um, sawdust blocks. Um, those are often sold wholesale for three or four dollars a pound. So one of the concerns was can we actually um, compete with that in terms of asking for basically double that or more for log grown shiitake, which you can see on the left. And the, the, the basic answer is, is yes, that's actually something the market's willing to pay for. And if we find the right customers, being chefs, uh, people interested in local foods, and awareness of the health benefits of mushrooms, one of the challenges is that most people think mushrooms don't have any nutritional value, but they actually have quite a bit. Um, we're actually able to, to uh, get that premium price, 12 to $16 a pound uh, as a retail price. Chatham did a, a study last year of existing growers in the Northeast, did a survey. 89% of those reported that demand is far greater than supply. Everyone's sold out and, and has a waiting list. Um, and we're seeing that folks are willing to pay more, which is a great, great entry level thing, problem to have. Um, we did a three year study with University of Vermont, Chatham University, 25 growers that were either existing producers or new producers. They all inoculated 100 shiitake logs and then kept a whole bunch of data on hours, costs, basically everything to do with their operation, which I'm really thankful for because that's not something farmers are usually up to do. And uh, they did great. Not everybody had complete data sets, um, but we found we had 15 that ended up having really robust data sets. Um, we learned a lot from all the rest, but we had to kind of pick through the data. But 10 of those 15 didn't make a profit in the second year from this operation. Um, the profit ranged, however, quite dramatically um, from $1.39 to $11.88 per log. And there's a lot of variability. That's where we can start to discuss best management practices and efficiencies. Um, and we'll talk about one example of that in a minute. So we're seeing an average profit per log being $5 a season or $15 to $20 over its lifetime um, in terms of, of, of the, the, the return. Um, which is pretty good because our costs going in are about $5 a log as well. So you make back your investment essentially in the first year, and then the second and third year you start to see um, profit from that. Um, so here's, here's the, the graph of showing the sort of profits and expenses and earnings and profit. You can see the actual variation is, is quite wide. One of the things we found is that some growers use this grant as an excuse to go out and buy that new chainsaw or uh, new ATV or new tractor implement to, to manage their logs. And so those were the ones that made a dollar something per, per log. Those that kept it really minimal or already had that equipment were the ones that could make much more per log. So that's one example of what we found. Um, I mentioned with cultivation research, um, we did a lot on species selection. Again, it kind of expanded the palette. Birch was actually one that, um, I don't know if Missouri ever looked at birch, probably not, <laughs> I would imagine. Um, we never looked at birch, but then found out growers were, were having really good success on all the, all the different birch species, which was interesting. So it's not always university stuff that, that shows that. Um, looking at when at cutting and inoculating is a really important consideration for when farmers can do this. So ideally, we're cutting in the dormant season and inoculating in spring. But the studies at Cornell showed basically you can cut and inoculate any time of year and it works. It's just not necessarily convenient. So that was a big important discovery. We looked at soaking logs versus sprinkling them overhead versus doing nothing to look at yield. We knew that yield on the nothing end would be lower than the soaking. But everyone always asks, can you, can you basically set up sprinklers and have the same yield? And it turns out you can't. It really needs to be a soaking function, which is really the largest management um, problem or challenge or, or opportunity because people can cancel their gym memberships and just move mushroom logs around their yard. So that's what we recommend now. Um, uh, looked at yields from, from soaking. That's where we got that quarter uh, to a half pound uh, per log per soak as an average gives people really nice ways to estimate. 
We also looked at some things like what to worry about versus not. So we had a lot of panicked growers that would get other fungi colonizing logs. Most of that fungi are, are uh, bark fungi that exist on the exterior of the log. Shiitake wants to consume essentially the sapwood or the interior of the log, so most of those are not a concern. One of the things we've, we've didn't do a study on but anecdotally found was that beech that was infected with beech bark disease is actually an okay substrate for mushroom production, as long as the bark is still intact enough that it's keeping moisture in the log, essentially. So again, the beech bark fungus um, tends to eat the bark and, and not so much the sapwood, so it seems to be working pretty well. And again, we're thinking about where efficiency um, and decision making really impact folks' bottom line. So again, from that study, had some really good information on um, where people were spending their time. The, the almost half the time is, is essentially in the uh, felling of trees and inoculating of logs, so the setup. Once you've got that log inoculated, again, you have it for three or four seasons, and moving it around and managing is actually not that much uh, work, relatively speaking. So. We started to ask some questions about how we could improve inoculation and, and also the tree harvesting. Um, so these are just some examples. It's actually probably more, unless you're an experienced tree feller, skitter, mover, all those kind of things, you may actually be better off buying bolts from someone else than um, doing them yourself. And we're seeing bolts being sold for $1 to $3 uh, per log. Talked a lot about efficient setup for inoculation. So um, just for example, if you had a log here and you were to inoculate it and then bring the, the spawn over and plug it in and then bring the wax over, that's l much less efficient than sort of a, you know, uh, assembly line style. And, and so we, you know, put up some suggestions on how people could build tables, build things so, to hold the logs so they wouldn't move and actually just move it down the line. Um, Designing the whole system, especially the lane yard, which is where you're managing your logs, to basically mini minimize the number of times you're moving them around. So some conversations around how people are, are you know, that's, that's the time crunch in the, in the maintenance. Um, stacking labor, it, it is good for production as well as um, in terms of the farmer season to stack your production. You're, you're harvesting and inoculating in late winter and spring. Um, and you know, <laughs> this is the one, avoid purchasing lots of extra equipment unless you really need it. So it actually is probably cheaper to not buy a chainsaw, all the gear, learn it, and stumble through the woods. It's probably cheaper to buy it from someone who has the experience and the equipment already ready to go. Which bummed some people out because they really wanted a chainsaw, but um, that was their choice. So that's cultivation on the support end. We've uh, really ramped up, we started this website with initial funds and have just continued to add more. Um, I mentioned on uh, Friday we're running out of space to put up more tabs. We keep adding more information about economics, policy, as things emerge. So ID is a relatively new page where uh, people are interested but concerned about positive identification of these mushrooms they're growing and so making sure they have information on how to, how to properly identify mushrooms. Things just keep popping up all the time. Um, some good successes, Virginia Tech and the e-extension network, which Kathy's going to talk about this afternoon, did a series of videos, two three-minute videos about how to inoculate. I really think that shorter is better. There was, there's research that shows that people watch videos less than five minutes most often, so they chunked this whole video into really small, digestible chunks. This was a publication that came out a few years ago that's a, uh, a really great resource combines our research um, and also grower information on, on cultivation and that's been invaluable to, to hand off to people that really want to get into this. Our listserv continues to be um, something that we, we started again as part of that three year study. We had money to support farmers to actually spend time, the experienced farmers to spend time like Steve Serk answering questions from new ones. But they've been great because that funding ran out and they've continued to answer questions. There's a really nice network where there's just an interest in continuing to support and help new growers not um, stumble through all the things that, that uh, we learned as, as initial adopters of this practice. And so it's really nice. You can pretty much guarantee a response within a day or two and usually six or seven responses. Listservs are something that sometimes work, sometimes don't work at all. We have a pig listserv through the Small Farms Pit program that gets like no traffic. Um, this one's very busy, so I, I never know why these work or they don't, but the mushroom one is, is doing quite well. Um, on the support end too, these are emerging things that we didn't expect. One of the things that started to happen is as growers um, became um, interested in their uh, policies, they uh, 
uh, started to get denied or dropped, uh, their insurance coverage started to be uh, knocked off. Um, they were either getting denied for policies or the, the company would contact them and say, uh, we're not interested in insuring you anymore. Um, and mostly it's just a misinformation. There was concern about uh, poisoning um, or the, the how different mushroom cultivation or potential contaminants. Essentially, it was a pretty easy process once we got into it. It was really this basic information and sort of um, resource sharing. We worked with the Farm Bureau. The Farm Bureau has partnered with Nationwide Insurance. And we basically said if we can get one company to agree to do it, then all of the chips will fall. We had some Nationwide and Farm Bureau people out to several mushroom yards. They saw the operation. They realized it was no different than like the risk of a vegetable operation. And that was kind of a done deal. So we're able to to offer that to growers, and now we're hearing that other, like farm family and statewide, are starting to see that nationwide is doing it and saying, well, I guess we better get on the boat too. So um, that's good to see. Um, another, another interesting thing, I went to the Eastern Plant Board, which is a number of state regulators in the Northeast, and talked to them about the relationship of moving mushroom bolts and uh, firewood regulations. There's a lot of restrictions on, on, and quarantines on firewood. Again, an education thing, a lot of concern about this, but you know, emerald ash borer is one of the most uh, species of concern, and we're not using that to cultivate any mushrooms. So uh, a lot of that conversation is just you know, letting them know what's actually going on. One last thing we're working on is, uh, is verification. Um, woodland mushroom growers want to differentiate their product from those indoor growers and explain. There's no standards developed for what that actually means. So uh, we've been excited to work with that. They actually approached us, and then there's a, a council of mushroom growers that are working on standards for both indoor uh, and outdoor uh, cultivation. And we've done things now because we have data. We can actually make the, the spreadsheets and the appealing kind of tools that help farmers be able to decide, well, how many logs? If I grow 100 logs, if I do 1,000 logs, what do the actual numbers look like? How much am I going to actually manage? So that's been something we've been working on um, lately. And finally. Um, Back to the big picture stuff, which is really, I think, important in the long term. Um, lots of landowners have forests like this. They generally see them as non unvaluable. And we're starting to be able to have a conversation about really bringing value. Uh, average tree you can harvest, you get 8 to 10 bolts out of that. If you think, yeah, I'm going to get $20 worth of mushrooms out of that, that's a pretty good value for, uh, for a low grade timber. right? Um, so there's lots of opportunities there. Um, it's encouraging people to actually manage their forests. And we're trying to bring that link back into our conversations about why people might want to get involved with shiitake in the first place. And the health and medicine is sort of the next, uh, next nut to crack. Uh, we have several growers already doing tinctures. Um, it takes very low volume of mushrooms to make tincture. You can also grow mycelium and actually grow it on grain and either sell the grain as a supplement or dehydrate the grain, uh, pulverize it, and essentially make, make pills. Um, and there's good research to support some of the, the the claims as a supplement. We have to be careful. We're not going to treat anything, but it's a good supplement. Um, so there's lots of interest there. And finally, value-added products. There's so much possibility with mushrooms to dry them, to soak them in things, to dehydrate them and make them into rubs. There's mushroom pate that people are selling. And so there's actually no excuse for any crop loss. I always tell growers, you have to figure out something to do with even your, your most slugged up mushrooms, because you can find something to, to make value from. And finally, this is the last slide. Um, just information-wise, right now, Chatham has done a great job of just doing a survey of who's out there and actually commercially growing. So it's a very small but early adoption group. Um, we have 60 growers, essentially, and about 18,000 logs in production. Everyone, on average, is making about $5,600 um, a year. And that's sort of, that's a side enterprise, often, to other farm ventures. And all these growers are projected to basically triple production in the next few years. So they're all starting small and then scaling up. And this really doesn't, this is only existing commercial growers. So we know there's hundreds more that are on that cusp of just getting started. Um, so I think we're going to see rapid growth in the Northeast. Thanks. Right, we do have time for a few questions. So. Steve, that, just that line right on the bottom. No, sorry. That's <laughs> that was to make sure you were paying attention. No. So yeah, again, 89% of those respondents in the survey said that demand is far outcreasing uh, okay. supply. Yeah. <laughs> Great note to end on, right? Yeah. That's good. Thanks, Steve. Uh, the, the sprinkling. Um, you know, I've, I've never you know, sprinkled. Uh, I've walked in the Northeast, so I mean, I 
crit stack them. Right. Don't worry about anything. Don't worry about range shadowing. I've got plenty of precipitation moisture. The sprinkling, uh, do you find any that use it just to keep the logs hydrated against you know, actual desiccation? So you know, further west in the Midwest, right. you know, we're kind of seeing that there's less precipitation, mm -hmm. more wind uh, risk. So you know, the crit stack is not working so well, maybe a, a lower age. Right. But I know some growers were just regularly irrigating, sprinkling, just, just yep. to prevent desiccation. Yeah, so that's a great point. The study we were looking at was looking at yield. Yeah. But yeah. Um, for, yeah. for actually maintaining high moisture in logs, sprinkling can be a good strategy. And as you mentioned, in windy areas or drier areas, a crib stack is sort of where you stack four logs this way and four logs this way. And in the Northeast, we'll stack them really high because it's easy use of space. But as you get into windier or drier areas, it's good to keep them, keep them low. So yeah, sprinkling's good for that kind of effect, um, for sure. Once you harvest a log, uh, how long uh, do you have to keep it out? Or do you, can you inoculate right away, or you have to cure it for a Yeah, so thanks for asking that. There's another, another aspect of the study, which was uh, a lot of the old literature said you have to wait because there's natural antifungal properties in a live tree that would, would basically kill off the mycelium. And essentially, we didn't find that to be true. We can basically, you could cut and inoculate the same day if you wanted to, yeah. Uh, what type of infrastructure were most of the participants in this research working on? Um, it, it varied, but you know what's nice about it is you really don't need much in terms of buildings or anything like that. Um, uh, you know, some people were using uh, angle grinders to to inoculate their kind of high power drills. You could use that. You could run that off a generator, that sort of thing. So people were doing their inoculations sometimes way back in the woods because they didn't want to haul their logs. It's all hauling logs is the game. So if you bring your logs to the barn and inoculate them, and then have to haul them all back out. You could, you could use a lot of time up. So it's pretty low infrastructure-wise. Um, inoculation gear is probably the most, most infrastructure intensive. Then maybe if you're going to do your cutting, your chainsaw gear, and that sort of thing, and a strong back, yeah. Yeah, so this is all forest grown. Uh, so then you need a lane yard, which is ideally like a, a conifer canopy, something that's shaded all year round, or, or second place would be really any forested canopy. So there's a balance between the ideal canopy and proximity to, to mount it monitoring, because you, you pretty much have to check them you know, daily, if not five, six times a, a week when they're actually fruiting. Like Steve said, I mean, ideally, if you have a nice conifer stand like hemlocks, perfect. But here in the Midwest, except for some cedars, mm -hmm. it's not like they're that. So things you've got to worry about in the wintertime. Right in the summertime, you've got you know, leaf cover. But in the wintertime, the trees use the leaves. There's actually a lot of uh, potential drying out from, from winter sun, so you may need to shape off in the winter time. Sure. Shade. In areas mm -hmm. where you don't have to be around shade. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, how far up can you grow them? Um, so we have we have some growers up in Ontario, um, and I would say I usually say up into up into Harding is zone four. Uh, Ontario is it the southern Ontario? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. It's uh, I know in southern and central Ontario. I'm not sure at the far reaches of northern Ontario. We have growers up in um, northern Vermont and in Maine doing this as well. Um, the the shiitake mycelium is hardy to at least zone four. No one's really looked at the the temperature hardiness. The question more is, is seasonality. So mushrooms generally want day and night temperatures above 55 or 60 degrees. So even right now in New York, we're getting uh, a lot of back and forth. And so our real season doesn't begin till like mid-June. So the growers up in Maine have to wait till July, and then they have August, and then they might be starting to be done. So the longevity of the season is a, is a question. Now, there are cold weather strains of, mush, of shiitake that fruit in response to those changes in temperature. And, um, and so there's new, new work, and, and people are interested in sort of the season extension p potential. We just had this year in our farm about 40 pounds of cold weather, and those are logs that we inoculated and don't soak. They just, they just show up when the temperatures are fluctuating. It's a nice kind of spring boost. So those came out in April and May. So. You have time for one more question? Yeah, would a like for overwintering for rain, winter suns, we don't have a lot of conifer stands. Would like an old barn structure work? Or yeah. would that like somehow devoid the whole forest growth? <laughs> yeah, it's a good question. We, we, we're running into this too because there's now interest. When you get into mushroom cultivation, then people want to do oysters. And oysters are usually grown on straw or some other uh, you know, high surface area substrate and want to grow in their old barn or this or that. I think forest is always the, the best ideal conditions. It's partially the, the, the natural humidity and the shade and really the aesthetic. <laughs> but I, would, I don't discourage anyone from using an old structure or a barn, especially if 
the reality is access and, and, and proximity to what they're already doing. If you're going to have to put your logs you know, on the back end of your property and it's going to be a hike, it's just not going to be a viable operation. So the, you know, the key is to get away from what I think are the, uh, di differentiate ourselves from the, the really essentially in Pennsylvania, the large industrial growers, which are in these large grow houses that are climate controlled. We can grow a lot of these mushrooms in natural, natural conditions pretty easily.